funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. The most traumatic event of modern Irish history was undoubtedly the Great Irish Famine of the mid-19th century. Before it had run its awful course, at least one million people had perished, and more than a million more had fled Ireland. Yet, believe it or not, it wasn't until well over a century after the famine occurred that any comprehensive scholarly books were published on this watershed in Irish history. What changed all that was a groundbreaking book called The Great Hunger, Ireland 1845-1849. Written by the British female historian Cecil Woodham Smith and first published in the year 1962. To find out more, I met up with historian Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee, on location at the Famine Memorial at Customs House Quay in Dublin City. We're standing here at the Famine Memorial that was done by the sculptor Rowan Gillespie to commemorate the Great Irish Famine of the 1840s. Cecil Woodham Smith was a well-respected historian at the time that she published her book The Great Hunger in 1962. Uh, She had published other works before and gained her reputation. But this book, The Great Hunger, was a very readable book. It's very accessible. It's scholarly. She was a scholar. She did an immense amount of research for this. But it's not a dry academic paper. It's something that anybody can pick up and read and learn from it. And so through that book, she brought the whole Irish famine to an audience uh, that had never been au fait with it before. Everyone knew the famine was there, but what she brought was the true, real story as opposed to just what had been passed down from generation to generation. And so it was a serious work backed up with facts and it told an alarming story that now being accessible, people understood the famine better, they had the facts better and it didn't make for comfortable reading but it was at the same time very readable. Is just one brief extract from chapter 16 in Cecil Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger, in which she describes the grim famine year of 1848 in Galway City. In 1848, famine was still devastating Ireland, worst in the West, but by no means confined to the West. In Galway, for instance, 3,000 starving beggars roamed the streets. Children, mere skeletons, screaming for food. Jails had become a refuge. The food given in prisons was better than in workhouses, and so people were most anxious to be committed, with 13,000 people shut in jails intended for 5,000. Cecil Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger was based on much hard evidence, the results of over 10 years of exhaustive research by her. Its impact on Irish famine studies was profound. Kathleen Villiers Tuttle, Connemara historian and also author of the book Patient Endurance, The Great Famine in Connemara. I think Cecil Woodham Smith's book made the famine accessible to all of us. And it was the first book I ever read on the famine. And I found it hugely informative and easily accessible. And it taught me so much that it made me want to investigate the famine further afterwards. I think that was what it was. Nothing I had learned in school, nothing I'd heard about or read about before that had the same effect that her book had on me. And I think it was, she just spoke in straightforward language. It wasn't heavy. It was accessible. That was about the best way I could describe it. I remember reading the book when it came out in the 1960s. I regarded it as the first really authoritative book on the Great Irish Famine. I was impressed by the book for many reasons. First of all, it was very well written. The narrative was compelling reading from start to finish. Her research was amazing. She used archives in Britain, Ireland, the United States and Canada and pulled them all together in a wonderful narrative. Bernard O'Hara of the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society. 
Here is Willie Henry, Galway City historian and also author of several famine-related books, including Famine, Galway's Darkest Years. I think she wrote a very fair account of the Irish famine and it was very well received and still to this day, to me, it's the one book that I could say that is the definitive work of the Irish famine. Really, Willie? I mean, you you would actually put it up there as the work that if you're going to start on the Irish famine, this is the one to go to, to begin the odyssey, so to speak. Yes. When I started working on my books on the famine, the first book I actually explored again was The, the Great Hunger. And it reawakened, as I said, the intenseness of the whole disaster that happened in Ireland. What is clear from prior commentary is that Cecil Woodham Smith's book, The Great Hunger, had a huge impact on our understanding of the Great Irish Famine. This is the story of that book and its author, Cecil Woodham Smith, the British historian who rewrote Irish famine history. Cecil Woodham Smith's book is The Great Hunger, Ireland, 1845 to 1849. It's a really influential book. Woodham Smith, she's the first big eye-opener about some of the realities, the felt realities on the ground of the famine in Ireland. She brings across the horror of it all and the reality of the famine as it affected people in their own localities on the ground, as we might say in that cliché. The sheer humanity of it. Here was a very sympathetic voice understanding the pain and the misery that was so much of an integral part of Irish history. It's a book of national importance. The Great Hunger, it punches you in the gut, but surely that's what it should do. Her book was very well received in Britain, in Ireland, in the United States, in Canada, and you could say in the whole English-speaking world. So it's very important. It is the foundation stone of Irish famine studies. Before delving further into why Cecil Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger is the foundation of modern Irish famine studies, first we need to investigate her roots. Professor Christine Keneally of the Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, USA. She was actually born in Wales, but her birth name was Fitzgerald, and she always claimed that she was a Fitzgerald of County Kildare. Some accounts actually linked her to Sir Edward Fitzgerald of 1798 fame. Her father was in the army, and there was a tradition of being officers in the army. She was educated in fairly affluent circles. She went to boarding school. She was expelled, so we sort of get an insight into her as a feisty young woman. She then went to Oxford University where she studied English. And although she was allowed to study, the atmosphere was very protective of young women and they were chaperoned. And also, even though, again, she was educated in Oxford and could study alongside the men, women were not allowed to matriculate. So she left Oxford but didn't formally get her degree until some years later. When you look at her background, like she was descended on her father's side from Lord Edward Fitzgerald in 1798 Rebellion. And her father, James Fitzgerald, fought in the Sea Pie Rebellion in 1867. And then you move over to her, her mother's side and you realise this woman was also connected to General Thomas Picton, one of the most courageous officers at the Battle of Waterloo, where he lost his life, uh, I might add. So, so I was looking at this woman, I could see that, that the power of her, that, you know, she didn't take it from the wind, so to speak, as we say here in Ireland. She had a, a background in, we'll say, not just military, but in people that would, were determined and were meticulous in what they believed in. Historian Willie Henry. And a perfect example of Woodham Smith fearlessly standing up for her beliefs occurred in 1916. Christine Keneally. She was at Oxford University in 1916 and apparently took part in a sympathetic march, which she said was, at the time, most English people were opposed to what was happening in Ireland, obviously, because of the war, etc. And after Oxford, she worked in London as a copy editor and she joined a group called the League for Self-Determination for Ireland. So she definitely always had an interest in Irish politics. And kind of a strong sympathy for for the underdog, so to speak. She did, yeah. She got older and she became quite a well-known public figure, public intellectual, as we might say now. She campaigned for a number of issues, for the death sentence to be brought to an end. She was involved in public campaigns for that. And for 
homosexuality to be decriminalised. She wrote a number of letters to the Times of London on that theme. She also wrote to the BBC complaining that their news and weather coverage ended at the six county border and that they should take an all-island approach. So again, you get a sense of somebody who wasn't afraid to let people know about her political affiliations and passions. In the year 1928, Cecil married a London solicitor named George Woodham Smith. She then postponed her career in order to raise their two children. What I admired about her as well, the more I think about her, she reared her children. She had a, an incredible uh, deep relationship with her husband, George Wynne Smith, and uh, they had two children. And she gave up her, she was always interested in writing, but she she decided that she was going to wait until her children were attending secondary school, or boarding school, should I say, before she attempted to write. And then she wrote Florence Nightingale. And as historian Willie Henry just touched on, Cecil Woodham Smith's first major historical book was on Florence Nightingale. It was during the height of the Second World War that she was motivated to write this book, Christine Keneally. So for eight years, her children were then at boarding school. She dedicated herself to researching and to writing about Florence Nightingale. The family gave her access to the private papers. Nobody had used them before. And her first book came out in 1950. And it came out to great critical acclaim and to commercial success. And the next historical book which Cecil Woodham Smith wrote was called The Reason Why about the disastrous Crimean War, which raged from 1953 to 1956. While doing her research on the Crimean War, she came across the Lucan family from the west of Ireland, from County Mayo, and she heard about their reputation during the famine, which wasn't a good reputation, but that made her determined to do something on the famine. Now, according to some accounts, she already had this great interest in the topic, and She knew that a number of academics in Dublin were writing a book and they knew she was writing a book. The first book to appear was The Great Irish Famine, which came out in 1956, edited by Edwards and Williams. And she had a correspondence with Dudley Edwards. And every now and again... We've been in UCD, it is the professor in UCD. They were both at UCD. And every now and again, Dudley Edwards would write a little letter to her and say... Cecil, are you still working on the book? And she responded, yes, I am. And it's actually proving the most difficult task I've ever undertaken. And it's taking me longer than I ever planned. And in fact, it took her almost 10 years of very intense research before she published The Great Hunger. Adam Smith's book The Great Hunger first came out in 1962. It was an immediate bestseller. Professor Katrin Shannon of Westfield State University in Massachusetts, USA. Well, it was an amazing piece of work, particularly at the time that it was published because there had been a kind of reluctance for there to be discussions about the experience of the famine and its consequences in Ireland for a lot of understandable reasons. And hers was really the first uh, popular book in the sense that it was easily accessible for the general public to read in a way that the earlier study edited by T.D. Williams and um, R. Dudley Edwards was not. And that earlier book, The Great Famine, edited by the UCD academics Williams and Edwards, which Catherine Shannon just mentioned, had been originally commissioned by the then Irish Taoiseach Eamon de Valera. Christine Keneally. De Valera had hoped it would be out for the 100th anniversary in 1945, but the book didn't appear until 1956, and it was about half the size of what had originally been planned. It had a number of contributors, eight contributors. Some of the essays were better than others. It's very uneven. Some have footnotes, some don't. And in the introduction... It was made very clear that the editors wanted to avoid any controversy when tackling the topic. So in other words, who's to blame? We don't deal with culpability. That's uh, verboten, as they say. Yeah, they really, I mean, they even say they wanted to avoid issues of culpability, which is 
maybe difficult to do when dealing with such a topic. They didn't want to talk too much about mortality. So in some ways, it was a sanitized view of that tragedy. And this opinion was actually expressed privately by one of the editors, Dudley Edwards, who left his diaries and Comico Grada was given access to them. And Dudley Edwards himself described it as desiccated history. So even he knew that it really wasn't tackling the issue, maybe in a way that did justice to the suffering of the Irish people. In contrast, he was very aware of Woodham Smith and her reputation. And he actually wrote, she has the ability to put the topic on fire. So he knew she definitely had that writing skill and ability. Until de Valera commissioned the book, uh, The Great Famine, from the UCD academics, that there hadn't been any major study of the famine before that. And that Cecil Woodham Smith's book, The Great Hunger, Ireland, 1845 to 1849, came soon after that. Brian McMahon, historian and also author of the 2017 book, The Great Famine in Tralee and North Curry, 1845 to 1852 in the popular mind and among many academics as well that it surpassed that that book The Great Famine. Why? Why? I suppose I would have to say the sheer humanity of it. It's not an academic study and she brings across the horror of it all and the reality of the famine as it affected people in their own localities on the ground as we might say in that cliche you know that's the sheer humanity of it and um, the scope and scale as I mentioned already I suppose it made us all just feel a little bit more Uh, for the people who suffered during the famine and to feel for what they went through and what society went through and and for the impact of it. Rather than just a dry academic or statistical study, it was a more human insight into everything. That this was real life, real people, real crisis and real death on the ground. That's right, yes. Shocking, shocking details as well, which some historians uh, have, have avoided because they are distressing. To read and they're distressing to research but uh, no she she doesn't flinch from presenting it at its worst for example the horrors that she reported one of them was in county cork where a woman and her two children were found dead and half eaten by dogs in a neighboring cottage she says five more corpses which had been dead several days were lying and then she talks about Father John O'Sullivan, the parish priest of Kenmare, who found a room full of dead people. A man, still living, was lying in bed with a dead wife and two dead children. So these are the kind of horrific human instances that she refers to and that we can't avoid, really, when studying or writing about the famine. One of the most important components behind the success of Woodham Smith's book, The Great Hunger, was that it was based on irrefutable evidence which she had unearthed over 10 years of extensive research. Dr. Gerard Morn, Associated Researcher with the Social Science Research Centre in NUI, Galway. Its significance was that it used source material which probably had not been looked at to any great detail by the collection of essays in 1956, in particular looking at the Porto Union records. And so what we see is we see a different approach, a different viewpoint, whereas many of the previous studies that had been done tended to look at history from the top down. Woodham Smith was more a bottoms up in terms of looking at the famine in areas which had suffered the greatest, in particular places like County Mayo. And we'll deal with Woodham Smith's pioneering research work on the Mayo Workhouse archives shortly. But first, what was the academic reaction to her famine book when it first appeared in 1962? Christine Keneally. Not all academics at the time reacted well to it. In fact, there was almost a closing of ranks by Irish academics. Possibly because Wooden Smith wasn't herself an academic. Um, she was not Irish, and of course she was a woman. So you know, on many levels, she was not part of that community. So the academic community wasn't as warm to her as they could have been. I actually was in Dublin at the time that the book was published and was studying at UCD. Professor Catherine Shannon of Westfield State University. And kind of recall the negative or dismissive attitude 
that was exhibited towards uh, her book by the professional historians. Why? Why? Well, I think it's a combination of factors, maybe a little bit of jealousy that they hadn't produced the same thing. And I suppose to a certain extent, the kind of historiographical style that was being pushed at the time, the kind of scientific history, didn't sit very well with the... I mean, her approach didn't sit very well with the people who were you know, trying to create an Irish historiography on those lines. And this, of course, would have been uh, Dudley Edwards and T.W. Moody. And, and of course, um, the stories of the famine, there were so many instances that people knew about on the local scene where Irish people did terrible things to one another during the famine period, that to a certain extent, opening up that topic let wounds fester. It was still quite sensitive. I think. Even uh, over a hundred years later. Mm. Well, the, the, the memories of people who would have gone in to lands where people had been evicted, in many cases, those memories were passed down from generation to generation. So there, there, there would have been that. The academic community may not have fully liked it. In Ireland, I mean, other people, the famous English historian H.A.P. Taylor, loved it. And for him, he was a Second World War historian who'd visited Belson. And he likened what he was reading in her book to Belson, which was actually very, very controversial. So some academics did very much like it. But I think she just had an ability as well to make a very painful, difficult topic accessible. So everybody could read her book and get something from it. She wasn't just writing for other academics. Christine Keneally. Here's Catherine Shannon once again. She had certainly a worldwide leadership, and the book sold very, very well in the United States. She was a very good writer. She's very, very accessible for the ordinary reader. And then, of course, you know, I don't think people... They'd, in Irish America, certainly, they'd heard about the potato famine, but they didn't really have, a, I suppose, a full description of the horrors of it. It was almost kind of the fascination of a horror show, that uh, some people might have the details. And it was clear that it was all document-based. Uh, I think it was just the detail and coming to understand so much of Irish American culture and attitudes were shaped by that famine and immigration experience. So I think it resonated with Americans in that respect. Well, uh, when the book first came out, I read it, and I had also read the book on Florence Nightingale because I trained as a nurse, so it interested me, and uh, I just found her very readable, and it was the first time I, the famine had really sort of, I think I'd vaguely heard of it, but hadn't really thought about what it meant before. British historian Robin Elwood. It was an amazing success. It certainly was a huge success, a big seller. I think it's because she's in very England. readable. In England. She's very readable, and um, perhaps we hadn't known anything much about it, hadn't thought about it before. Because she moved in the circle she moved in, in London society, she was in a privileged position in some ways that maybe an Irish person at the time couldn't have been so critical of the British government. Perhaps one of the key reasons behind the initial success of the book The Great Hunger in Britain was the fact that its author was British, not Irish. Historian Rob Goodbody. That she was a British historian I think made a difference as well because this wasn't just some other Irish person complaining about the way Ireland was treated during the famine. She was British and she describes in detail from her researches how the administration in the United Kingdom failed the people of Ireland. Yeah. I think perhaps it came better from her really because it wasn't an Irish name so it wasn't we wouldn't have thought it was somebody you know just twisting the facts or anything. British historian Robin Elwood. One person who loved Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger was the Irish president of the 1960s Eamon de Valera. Now another admirer was the Irish public figure and social commentator Conor Cruz O'Brien, Christine Keneally. 
Conor Cruz O'Brien, but he was actually, I think, provost of a university in Ghana at the time, um, because he's obviously academic. And he felt that this book, um, and he, in fact, he had evidence because the president of Ghana at the time had read the book and was reading it for the second time, had read The Great Hunger. And Conor Cruz O'Brien felt that this was really good because it broadened out the president's understanding of what colonization meant and what Conor Cruz O'Brien said. He's now realizing it's not just Africa that has suffered and he's taking great lessons from this. And so Conor Cruz O'Brien just felt that what Woodham Smith was writing about, yes, she was writing about Ireland, but famine is universal. Colonization, unfortunately, has been international. So he felt great international lessons could be drawn from this book. So happy were the Irish government of the day with Woodham Smith's book, The Great Hunger, that she was given various awards. Galba City historian Willie Henry. The National University of Ireland awarded her an honorary doctorate at the time in 1964, two years after the book came out. She also received other awards for it. She was awarded a number of times at different universities. She rewrote the story of the famine's sad tale in a book, The Great Hunger, her words would not fail To research the truth in the benchmark campaign When a million souls died of starvation and pain She asked many questions of the blight and the fear and wrote down the answers no one wanted to hear The government's role and the empire's neglect In a fearless campaign to explain and correct And as was mentioned earlier, Woodham Smith pioneered the research of workhouse records. Christine Keneally she was groundbreaking. She was one of the first people to use and to recognise the value of workhouse records. So in 1838, the British government had provided legislation to divide the whole of Ireland into 130 workhouses, into unions, each with a workhouse. And they were pretty cruel establishments, deliberately meant to be so. But during the famine, they were the institutions that provided relief throughout the famine. And workhouse records, they had boards of guardians who kept actual records, minutes of what was going on. And nobody had used these records before. And she decided to use the records in County Mayo, which really were not in good condition. She wrote about herself and her husband climbing up into an attic. There were mice there. There was dust. There was no lighting. She had to use torches. And she used these records. After her book came out, the records were in fact taken to the National Library in Dublin, where they are when I used them in the 80s, and they are to this day. Uh, so in some ways she performed a rescue operation. But again, that depth, you that local, local knowledge, so meticulous. The workhouse at Mill, Castle Bar, Swinford and Westport, she used extracts from the minutes books of all these unions to see what happened to the different unions. Historian. Bernard O'Hara. What amazed me was that very early in the famine, the workhouse of Mayo went bankrupt, starting with Ballina and Castle Bar, Ballina and Westport. And um, she showed you know, the, the conflict that existed at local level between state policy and what was happening on the ground. The tenant farmers couldn't afford to pay the poor law rates. Some landlords were willing to help out, others weren't. And the whole system just collapsed at local level and there was a big incentive for landlords to get tenants off their land if they couldn't afford to pay the rent and rates and um, this contributed to debts and it also contributed to mass immigration. So her story in Mayo was very well captured. And here is a brief extract from chapter 15 of the book The Great Hunger, in which Woodham Smith describes the calamitous state of the Mayo workhouse system in 1847. Castle Bar Workhouse was in hopeless disorder. 
The organization had broken down in January 1847 and never been re-established. By July the 31st, for example, no entry had been made in the weekly relief list since January and no record of purchase of clothing existed since September 1846. At Balinar, the lack of food in the workhouse was so great that on July the 5th, 1847, the doctor told the guardians that the inmates were starving and that in his opinion, some of them had actually died of starvation. One of the areas that William Smith concentrates on is the Casabar workhouse. Okay, we actually know that the level of mortality, and in particular infant mortality, in the spring and early summer of 1847, you were talking in the region of two to three hundred dying every week. Historian Gerard Moore. Here's Bernard O'Hara once more. The situation at Mayo was very bad, but in Eris it was particularly bad. Eris was looked after by the Bellinay workhouse, and Bellinay workhouse, as we saw, wasn't able to cope with demand around that area, never mind as far west as Eris. It was later in the family before a workhouse was eventually built in Belmullet. It was toward 1849, that period. So the worst effects of the family were over by the time there was a local workhouse. So the Eris suffered enormously. Parts of Eris and the Mullet, you have large-scale evictions taking place by landlords like John Walsh. And what happens is it leads to very high levels of mortality because these were people who just were not able, when they were evicted, to get to the workhouse in Bellina. A notorious example of eviction was supplied by the unhappy district of Belmallet in Eris on the estate of a Mr Walsh. He lived in Cross Malina and was a magistrate, but had taken no part in relief work during the famine. The inhabitants of three villages were evicted by him with the help of a company of the 49th Regiment. Their houses were thrown down and they were turned out in the depth of winter to exist as best they might. The largest of these hamlets was Malaro on the peninsula of the Mallet. Mr Hamilton, the temporary poor law inspector at Bell Mallet, brought James Hack Tuke to the site, and a woman who had been evicted made a statement in the presence of the most respectable witnesses, including a clergyman of the Church of England. She had been, she said, living in Malaro with her husband when young Mr Walsh and two drivers came about ten days before Christmas and evicted them. Very soon they were all turned out of doors and the roofs of their houses pulled down. That night they made a bit of a shelter of wood and straw, but the drivers destroyed them and drove the homeless people from the place. It would have pitied the sun, she said, to look at them as they had to go away head foremost under hail and storm. Their wailing could be heard at a great distance. And as was mentioned earlier in this documentary, Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger excels at revealing what occurred during the Great Irish Famine in many local communities throughout Ireland, whether ours or wherever. John McTiernan, historian and also former Sligo County Librarian, gives his opinion of the book. Well, I came across it in, in the library context. I remember now it was, a, uh, it was a book that was very popular for readers. And I, I remember at the time reading it myself, but because there was so much material on, I always looked at the Sligo references rather than reading the book as a whole. <laughs> and in that way, I got a fair amount of background information locally, which Wood Martin and O'Rourke were the two county historians who published their histories of Sligo in the 1880s, 1890s. So she was coming along half a century later. Which obviously it is a lot of research and 
was speaking from uh, what she found or it was the situation in Sligo, which O'Rourke and Wood Martin may have been aware of, but didn't, didn't print it, didn't use it in the text. So they were very general, but they weren't specific. Well, she travelled the country very um, thoroughly from county to county and uh, she did quite a good coverage of the situation in Sligo during the famine years. The reason that she wrote about Sligo was that so many people emigrated from the port. So you must remember with the only deep water port between Galway and Derry. So a lot of people from Sligo, North Mayo, South Donegal, Fermanagh, Elitrum funneled through Sligo. What's very common in Sligo in the 1830s in the trade directories is the amount of shipping agents for the New World and the Americas. And of course they increased rapidly during the famine. They made money out of it. Sligo local historian Fiona Gallagher. And staying with the topic of emigration. Odom Smith's book The Great Hunger doesn't just investigate famine, suffering and starvation in Ireland, but also devotes many pages to the stories of those famine victims who fled Ireland. Historian Rob Good body. She talks about the effect of the Irish famine on America, on Britain, particularly Liverpool, and on Canada. The effect of these huge numbers of people coming in, people who are destitute, dying and fevered, with no resources whatsoever, hardly even clothes on their backs, in huge quantities into places like Quebec, Montreal, into Boston, into New York, and in the United States, she describes how they managed to curtail the influx to a large extent. Canada didn't, but how the existing communities in those areas were swamped. And again, in Britain, particularly Liverpool. In January 1847, the numbers of destitute Irish arriving into Liverpool became a deluge. By then, the parish of Liverpool contained about one quarter of a million inhabitants. But during the week ending Saturday, January the 23rd, 1847, over 130,000 people received relief in Liverpool. Mr Campbell, rector of Liverpool and chairman of the Select Vestry, wrote to Sir George Grey, the Home Secretary, that on a single day over 23,000 persons had been given food, over half of whom were children. In a nutshell, the parish of Liverpool, wrote the rector, was being ruined. There were no funds to meet such a demand. Further, the cheap lodging houses were filled to overflowing and fever had appeared. What is clear from much of the commentary so far in this programme is that Cecil Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger is backed up by a huge amount of research. So just how good and extensive was her research? Galway City historian Willie Henry. Reading the book in the 60s and now reading it again, I was enthralled by it. And I remember when I was starting my own work on the for Mercier Press, I had produced two books. One was Coffin Ships and the other one was Galway, It's Darkest Days, The Famine in Galway. Now, I decided to explore her book again and it reawakened the whole disaster of the famine. And I could see from her, and what I didn't see in the 1960s, that I could see immediately that she had done meticulous research on this book and she hadn't trusted the already published sources. She even went beyond the newspapers. She went to the government records of the day. The extent of the research that she undertook is just mind-boggling. I think the first time I read it, I probably wouldn't have bothered about the footnotes in it. But recently, I have realised that the amount of research that went into it is just phenomenal. Historian Brian McMahon. There are about 500 pages in the paperback edition, and 80 pages are just lists of her footnotes, her endnotes. And when you look at the scope and scale and range of them, you realise there was years and years of work put into this. And as a researcher myself, I can appreciate how difficult that was for her. I think we're all the same, you know, once you've been studying history for on decades, so yeah. to speak, you begin to realise, right, for every page that's in this book, and, you know, she puts down two sentences about a certain mm. place, she's had to look up 20 pages in some that's archive, it. in some yes. for- forgotten 
archival corner of yeah. Ireland, whatever, yeah. or wherever it may be, uh, to get this information. Yes, that's right, because she looked at, say, the Board of Guardian Minute Books, in, for Mayo in particular, and I know from looking at those in, in Tralee and Kerry that it's very hard to extract information from them. They are just like the minutes of meetings at which some very routine matters came up and some very uh, major matters would have come up, you know. But you have to fill it through them and find out what was uh, most relevant. And you also have to cope with people's handwriting, different handwriting, although the clerks of the unions, I suppose, would have been very diligent and very clear in the way they wrote. But she also went to the National Archives in, in England and consulted the Treasury papers there, again, which involved many different individuals. And you also had the inspectors who were based around the country who were sending back their reports to London as well. And they all had m- minute details. So she had to wade through all of that. I really am in awe of her achievement, I have to say. However, it's worth pointing out that because Cecil Woodham Smith was of sufficient financial means, she was able to use two research assistants in her research work. Professor Christine Keneally of Quinnipiac University, Connecticut. She was able to employ a research assistant. Um, she employed a, a relative, Phyllis Wooden Smith, to help her in London, mostly to transcribe. And interestingly, in Ireland, the person she had helping her was a man a lot of historians would be familiar with, R. B. McDowell, who taught at Trinity College. He was teaching when I was a student at Trinity College, and. He was very interesting because he was very open about his politics. He came from Belfast. He was a unionist. He belonged to the British Conservative Party. And so when you think that Woodham Smith is often seen as a nationalist, yet here she is working with Brendan. And she felt he was ideal because of that difference. Well, McDowell uh, was the junior dean in Trinity uh, when I was there. He's a remarkable man. I mean, he was a very, very, very good Irish his- historian and, and very readable. Still important to actually read. Australian Irish historian Richard Reed. But the fact that he, of all people, should have been Woodham Smith's researcher on a topic like the famine where she comes out with a book which is very condemnatory of British government as we know McDowell was a British conservative uh, from Belfast you know and had all that kind of background and here he is running running around finding out all these horrendous things about the famine for Cecil Woodham Smith and doing I mean, a very good job doing a it, tremendous well. job on it what he was a thorough researcher I mean he was a top flight guy in terms of Irish history so I think that's probably the most remarkable thing her right-hand person in Ireland on all this material that she's gathering is R.B. McDowell of Trinity College, Dublin. Since the Great Irish Famine occurred over a century and a half ago, some people have argued that official policy in Ireland at the time amounted to genocide. Now, in her book, Cecil Woodham Smith broaches the contentious issue of genocide. Dr. George Moore. She doesn't really classify it as genocide. She classifies it as a major mistake by the British government not knowing. Because I think what you have to realise as well is that Ireland is governed by Britain since 1801 with the Act of Union. It should be treated in the same way as other places. Because when we look in 1847, when you have a crisis in Lancashire, the government pours a lot of money, a lot of relief into Lancashire, but they don't do the same thing with regards to Ireland. As she describes it, it's not in the sense of that we know there was that the extermination of the Jewish populations in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, in fact, as well, during the Second World War, not so much in that sense of the word or with the or the, the ways Cromwell devastated the country during his period, but certainly there was a serious element or lack of action by the government of the day. And I would dearly have to say that in a lot of cases, while they may not have intended to perpetrate genocide on the Irish population, they certainly didn't care enough to feed them. And they certainly didn't care enough to actually do something about the devastation. Historian Willie Henry. Here's Bernard O'Hara. One thing she concluded at the end, that the Great Irish Famine was not caused by genocide. And then she went on to talk about it's not a characteristic of the British people to behave like they behaved in Ireland at that time. She said that the British had always proved themselves to be capable of generosity, tolerance and magnanimity, but not where Ireland was concerned. And um, 
one thing she would not to explain then is the catastrophe was completely outside the normal experience at the time. The blight, people did not know what the blight was at the time. So it wasn't foreseeable to any big extent. So in fairness to Britain, that has to be taken into account in evaluating the Great Famine. And in fairness to Woodman Smith, she did that in the concluding chapter of her book. Because Woodham Smith's book The Great Hunger had the ability to make a very painful and difficult topic accessible to a mass readership, not just academics, as a result it had a huge impact on culture, inspiring many artists, writers, poets and balladeers. Christine Keneally. She inspired Seamus Heaney to write his famine poetry. She inspired Pete St. John to write his song, The Fields of Athen Rye. So she had a major impact on culture as well, that reawakening of awareness about the famine. She was, of course, a bestseller. So if you like, it was acknowledged by the plain people of Ireland at the time when they bought the book and read it. She was a very good writer. She's very, very accessible for the ordinary reader. It's very readable. It's not like dry history. It brings it to life. Her writing is very fluid. It's very easy to read. She tells the story which engages the reader, which is not always the case with professional historians. It just made compelling reading. She wanted people to read it. And it was inspirational. It was an amazing success. So fluid the story that emotions were raised in a story that flowed compelling and praised inspiring poets to verses and song to ignite Seamus Heaney and spur Pete St. John So let's praise the great hunger a book of acclaim when so many die to an empire's shame. Let's praise the great lady giving freely her days to truthfully write of the famine's cruel ways. And at this juncture in our investigation of Wadham Smith's 1962 book, The Great Hunger, it's again worth asking how important was the book to modern Irish famine studies. Bernard O'Hara. Oh, I think it's very important. If you look at any local history in Ireland today, you will see what happened in Smith's book listed as a reference. When I read the book when it came out, I did not realise it was one of the very few publications available in the Irish famine. And what's amazing now, looking back on it, that there was such a dearth of material related to the famine until the 1990s. Irish scholarship has really caught up with the famine in the 1990s to coincide with the 150th anniversary of the Great Famine. But before that, the gospel in the Irish famine was Woodham Smith. And um, her book was very well received in Britain, in Ireland, in the United States, in Canada, and you could say in the whole English-speaking world. So it's very important. It is a foundation stone of Irish famine studies. And as Bernard O'Hara just touched on, from the publication of The Great Hunger in the 1960s right up to the 1990s, there was a dart of scholarly work on the Great Irish Famine. Here's Willie Henry to explain why. My own opinion of it is really that it wasn't through a lack of interest on, we'll say, from an Irish perspective, but I think people had to be very aware of the troubles that were going on in the North and they didn't want to antagonise the situation because it could be used as a flogging post as well to create more violence and trouble in Ulster at that particular time. And I think that there was, in fact, when you look at it, the Easter commemoration in 1966 went ahead, but after 1969, they died a death. But within Ireland, very little happens until, and I was part of that new wave of famine research in the mid-1990s, coinciding with the 150th anniversary, there is a renewed interest in the famine at every level. And there's a whole new wave of books that come out. Professor Christine Keneally of Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, USA. So in the last 20 years, you know, there's just been a great interest. 
which seems not to be subsiding. And as a result of that, you know, we've learned so much about the famine. But really, if we look to a founding mother, it's Cecil Wooden Smith. She is the one who really, really set the agenda for what would come in the 1990s. Yes, she did, because where else would we learn about it? Uh, when I did my PhD in the 80s, it was on workhouses in Ireland, which led to my first book, This Great Calamity. My supervisor didn't particularly like Cecil Wooden Smith's book, but he told me I needed to read it, read it with caution, but I needed to read it because there really wasn't anything else. Incredible that something so important, so tragic, something that was a watershed in Irish history, really was so little was known at the scholarly level. And clearly, as Wooden Smith showed us, the records were there. They just needed to be used. The book more or less becomes the benchmark for the studies that subsequently takes place, especially in the 1990s. It is a major work in the historiography of the famine and of a changing Ireland. So what was Cecil Woodham Smith's greatest service to Irish history? Historian Bernard O'Hara. As a British historian, I think she gave the famine story enormous credibility. There's no way any Irish person, regardless how imminent they are, would have been able to do the same. And right away, the book was accepted in Britain. The British started to look at what happened during the Great Famine and to have sympathy for the Irish. And I think it's a turning point in Irish history, really. I think the Irish people and the Irish race owe her an enormous debt, debt of gratitude. And she certainly d- deserves to be remembered in Irish history. And Christine Keneally shares her opinion, making reference to the 1956 book The Great Famine, Studies in Irish History. I think... She reassured people in some ways because the Great Famine hadn't addressed some of the central issues. It left people just wondering, was their knowledge of the famine, was it wrong? Was it so awful? But what she did was she actually made it, I suppose, she was unequivocal that this was a terrible, terrible tragedy that occurred at the heart of the British Empire. The British Empire was incredibly powerful, knew what was going on and had resources that they could have tapped into. But the fact they chose not to, the fact that some landlords chose not to help, again, one million people did not need to die. And I think that's her contribution, that she made us realise again that the famine was not inevitable. Right, in other words, the whole issue of culpability, she tackled it head on. She did, she tackled it head on. That was a brave thing to do, but she tackled it head on and she backed it up with evidence, which I think is, you know, again, one of her great contributions, the depth and extent of her research. Willie, what's her greatest service to Irish history? Well, for me, it's that she produced this book. It's a book of national importance. It's a book that that is very reliable in its information. It's extremely reliable. She produced it at a time when it was badly needed. And if people want to know anything about the Irish famine, they should really read this book first and then take it from there. All guitar music and songs in this documentary are by Cliff Wedgbury. And until we meet again in some other hidden avenue of Irish history, well, I'm going to leave you with various contributors commenting on Woodham Smith's magnum opus, The Great Hunger, Ireland, 1845 to 1849. Their comments are followed by Cliff Wedgbury singing his song, The Ballad of Cecil Woodham Smith. Cecil Woodham Smith's book, The Great Hunger, it has stood the test of time. It's even still in print today. So it's a tribute to the energy of the writing, to the depth of the research, that over 50 years later, the book is still read by people. She rewrote the story of the famine's sad tale in a book the great hunger her words would not fail 
to research the truth in a benchmark campaign when a million souls died of starvation and pain She asked many questions of the blight and the fear and wrote down the answers no one wanted to hear the government's role and the empire's neglect in a fearless campaign to explain and correct She rewrote the tale of the Blight's history Her words would not fail in that truth's bravery Devoting ten years of her life to the task She travelled the West with a spirit steadfast De Valera would praise her groundwork and care In a best-selling story of neglect and despair the depth of her research was amazing to see Filling the reader with great sympathy So fluid the story that emotions were raised In a story that flowed compelling and praised Inspiring poets to verses and song To ignite Seamus Heaney and spur Pete St. John So let's praise the great hunger, a book of acclaim When so many die to an empire's shame Let's praise the great lady giving freely her days To truthfully write of the famine's cruel ways She rewrote the story of the famine's sad tale In a book the great hunger her words would not fail to research the truth in a benchmark campaign When a million souls died of starvation and pain So let's praise the great hunger, a book of acclaim When so many died to an empire's great shame Let's praise the great lady giving freely her days to truthfully write of the famine's cruel ways To truthfully write of the famine's cruel ways Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee